A big thanks to Policy Genius for sponsoring this video. Ouch! Forgot there was a stool there. Hey, welcome to another video. You might be asking yourself, why do you have all this wood here? Well, that's a dumb question. It's a woodworking channel, isn't it? And I'm gonna build something with it. A table. Yes, another table video. I've done a lot of those, but this one's a little different. This is gonna be a completely round table. And when I say completely round, I mean the top's round, the base is round, the material I'm building the base out of is round. Round, round, round. Why do I do this to myself? I'm gonna be constructing a modern-esque white oak dining room nook table with some solid white oak stock. And this, this is nosing trim, nosing like my mother-in-law. No, she's just nosy. <laughs> no, really, she is. Anyways, this is nosing trim. This is typically used on the nose of stair treads to kind of give it that nice round profile. You just tack it on there. But I'm gonna use this to create a modern looking round dining nook table. And I'm gonna show you how I do it. So, follow along with the video, enjoy yourself. Subscribe down below, go follow me on Instagram, Patreon, Facebook, all that stuff. Links in the video description to all the tools and supplies. And that's about it. Dang it, I forgot about the frickin' stool again. So, as I mentioned, we'll be building this table out of this nosing trim. Nosing? Ugh. Hurts your nose. That's what that does. Yeah. So, we gotta start breaking this down. Now, I needed to cut all of this nosing to a uniform length. My tabletop is gonna be a standard 30 inches high, but she got the one inch top on there. So, I'm cutting down each piece of trim to just shy of 29 inches. I say just shy because I'm gonna float them off the floor just about an eighth of an inch so they're not rubbing along the, well, the floor. So I set up a stop on my miter saw and I just started cutting down pieces. First I cut off the factory end to make sure that I had a nice flush place to start and then I just ran these long lengths through one at a time until I had a whole bunch of little pieces. You can see with a few of these little pieces cut exactly what the base of our table is going to look like. If you stand them all on end, you get this nice reeded, fluted pattern. I don't know what to call it. So anyways, yeah, I just started cutting down a whole bunch more pieces. Now the amount of pieces that you're going to cut is going to be directly determined by the circumference of your base. As we know, length divided by pi gives you a circumference. So if you got 57 inches of these pieces, well you divide that by pi and that will give you the circumference of your base. Now all these pieces are cut, but they're a little too thick as you can see here. They're about, oh, an inch and a quarter. That's just too beefy. I don't need them to be that big. So I decided to trim them all down so that I had smaller pieces of just that half round to work with. So I went over to my table saw and I just started trimming off a good three quarters of an inch from each individual nosing piece. You can see the difference in size here after I've cut a few. You got the big one and the small one. There's just no reason to leave them that big and I thought making them smaller would also make them easier to work with. Now, if you watched a few videos ago, I made some tambour nightstands. I'm gonna use the exact same technique I used in that video to make the tambour to hook all of these pieces into one large sheet that will be bendy and I can manipulate into a circle around my base. So the first thing I had to do was make a jig to hold all of my pieces and allow me to attach a canvas backer. Now the hard part with this is the pieces are round on the bottom, which means I can stick them all in there, but they're not gonna wanna lay flat. So my solution was to try and make this jig as tight on those pieces as possible. 
I figured by wedging them in place that would keep them from rocking back and forth. I didn't get it quite as tight as I wanted in some places, but that's okay. I think it will ultimately work and serve its purpose in the end. So after getting all of my pieces laid into the jig, I decided to take a break from that for a while and start gluing up the slab for my round circular top. Well, before I can actually get to gluing it up, I have to cut down and mill all the pieces. So I took some six quarter white oak over to my miter saw and I started roughly cutting it to the length. This is gonna be a 40 inch circular top. So I cut each piece to about 42 inches to give myself a little wiggle room on each side. After cutting my pieces down, I ran them through the joiner on two sides and then took them over to the table saw to cut them to a uniformed width. After I was done making a bunch of dust over on the table saw, I ran all the pieces through the planer to bring them down to my final thickness of exactly one inch. Then I just laid out all my pieces next to each other in some clamps and I added some glue. Now whenever I'm doing a slab top of any type, I always get questions about biscuits and dominoes and dowels and if they're necessary to put in between each board. The answer is no. You don't need to as long as your boards are milled properly. Dowels and dominoes will add zero strength to the overall top. All they're really there for is alignment and making sure your boards are even. But when you're an expert miller like me, at least I like to think I am, it's pretty easy to get all your boards nice and flushed and clamped together. After I clamped them all up, I wiped down a little bit of the glue squeeze out and it was back over to my jig to get the canvas back around these pieces. And that's when I realized I've got to finish them first. Oh, darn it. I was just ready to glue the canvas on here when I remembered back to my tambour nightstands that before I can do that, I need to pre-finish each individual slat because there's really no good way to finish them after the fact. So after preparing myself mentally, I started the arduous task of finishing each individual piece. Now I should note that I'm only finishing the outside of the piece. I am not finishing the back. The reason being that I have to glue canvas to the back of this and if I put finish on it, well, my glue is not gonna stick very well. So after finishing each piece, I then reinserted them into my jig to get them ready to glue my canvas on. After I got all the pieces in place, I added one last piece of plywood on the end to just kind of squish them all together and get rid of any gaps that might have formed in between each piece. I just held this plywood down with a few screws and with that, I was ready to start adding my canvas. Now I taped a border around the outside of all my pieces so that my canvas wouldn't go right to the edge. This will make it a lot easier to cut the canvas to size after it's all glued up. So with just a simple pair of scissors, I roughly cut the canvas in a shape that would somewhat fit all of my slats, and I took it over to my work table to smear it with glue. See? Smearing it with glue. You would be surprised how much stinking glue it takes to cover a piece of canvas. It just soaks in and you really gotta use a whole heck of a lot. And then after coating the canvas in glue, I went back over to my slats and I coated the back of all of them with glue. Now I'm using Tightbond 3 for this application because it's got a longer work time than Tightbond 2. The last thing you want is that glue to start setting up before you get a chance to get your canvas down. Then when you're laying your canvas, the most important thing is just to get it nice and smooth without any wrinkles. This can take a little fiddling with to get it to the proper placement. But as long as your glue is nice and wet, it's really not that difficult to move that canvas around. Once you get the canvas laid out exactly how you want it, you get to do my favorite part. And that is rub it. I don't know why, I just really like rubbing this canvas onto the glue. Kind of feels like I'm giving a good friend a back massage at the beach. You know, smoothing away all those wrinkles, making sure I get everything rubbed out. This just got really weird. I apologize. 
The other thing is by rubbing the canvas, you're creating friction, which will initiate the glue's setting process. So it's just a good idea to rub it. I'm not trying to be weird. The next morning I came out and my glue was nice and dry and it was time to start cutting my canvas to size. By cutting to size, I mean just cutting away all the loose ends that didn't get directly glued to the wood itself. So I just took a razor blade, peeled the edge back until I saw a little exposed wood and I trimmed off all the extra little bits and bobs. Then with all my canvas trimmed down, I removed my plywood border on two sides and I pulled my panel free. As you can see, there are some seams that are a little stuck together. This is normal because we did rub glue on the entire back. So you just gotta go through and kinda individually break each seam until it moves freely. But just like that, we now have a complete panel of this ribbed, fluting, reeded oak stuff that is nice and bendy and will be easy to form into a perfect circle to make up our base. This video was sponsored by Policy Genius. You know, summer's coming to an end, the leaves are starting to fall, but while Mother Nature does her thing to prepare, you can prepare by getting free quotes for life insurance from Policy Genius. You know, having a family means having responsibility. You have to make sure that everybody's taken care of at any given point which is why life insurance was such an important thing for me and my family. I wanted to make sure that if the worst were to happen, my family would be taken care of. And that's where Policy Genius came in. And getting quotes was surprisingly easy. In minutes, you can work out how much life insurance coverage you need and compare personalized quotes to find your best price. When you're ready to apply, the Policy Genius team will handle the paperwork and scheduling for free. Policy Genius never sells your information to other companies, and Policy Genius doesn't add on extra fees. The licensed experts at Policy Genius work for you, not the insurance companies, so you can trust them to help you navigate every step of the shopping and buying process. Policy Genius makes it easy to compare quotes from over a dozen top insurers all in one place. And here's the kicker. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. So, you're probably wondering what to do next. Well, don't worry, I'm gonna tell you. This really couldn't be any easier. Just head to policygenius.com slash bourbon moth to get started right now. Policy Genius, when it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. Now we may have our panel all glued up and flexible, but you're probably asking, is that strong enough to be the base? Well, no, no it's not. Next, I needed to make a plywood frame to attach my ribbed panel to. So I got a bunch of tape that looks like random dominoes and I just taped it all over a piece of plywood. This is probably very confusing to you, but the reason I did this is because I just got a brand new toy it's called a Shaper Origin, and it's basically a handheld CNC router. So you put all this tape down, which is kind of a map for the Shaper to follow. Then you just run the Shaper all over your surface to trace out the work area that you're working in. And then the cool thing is you can design shapes directly on this router. Now I know I needed a circle that was 17.375 inches in diameter. So I just typed that into the little computer screen and then I made a mark on the plywood where I wanted the center of that circle to be. So I find the mark on the screen and once I found that mark, I just placed my circle right there. Now the cool thing about this router is it's kind of like a video game. It shows you on the screen the path that you have to cut and it's got a self-adjusting router head so as long as you're within about a quarter of an inch on either side of that line it will auto correct to ensure that you get a perfect cut which means that you can cut out things like circles without the need for jigs or screwing something down to the middle of your piece 
Yes, I am aware that this is an expensive tool and not everybody has one. So don't let that stop you from building this piece. You can build all these parts with a simple router jig. It'll just take a little bit longer. But because I have this new toy, of course I'm gonna use it. And I will say it was super fun and handy. And I did feel like I was just standing in my shop playing video games the whole time. In no time, I was able to cut out a perfect circle from this 3 quarter inch plywood. Now all we have to do is test and see if it's the right size to wrap this panel around. I don't know. Is it going to fit? Ooh. Wouldn't you know that on my first try, it was absolutely perfect. I'm just going to say that's because I used the origin. I'm not that good in real life. So after cutting one circle for my top, I cut another circle out for my bottom. Top and bottom of the table base, not my own personal bottom that's above my knees and below my elbows. Anyways, thinking ahead, as I don't often do in building, I realized that I couldn't put a solid circle on the top and bottom of my base because this would make it impossible for me to attach my base to my top because I wouldn't be able to get inside of it to attach it. So after cutting out both of my circles, I decided to cut out the interior of one of those circles, which will become the bottom of my base. So leaving the tape on there and actually adding just a little bit more, I cut another circle, again with the Shaper Origin, quick and easy. Now I had a way of accessing the inside of my base and attaching it to the top. Boom. Next, I needed a way of connecting my top and bottom piece together. So I took some more scrap 3 quarter inch plywood and I ripped some pieces down on the table saw and cut them to the correct length. The idea is to kind of use these pieces as ribs connecting the top and bottom and giving me more surface area to attach my reeded white oak panel. Now I have eight ribs in total that I want to use to connect this top and bottom. So I needed to mark out exactly where I wanted all those to land. Now I could have used math and a tape measure and got these all perfect, but it really doesn't matter. So I just kind of eyeballed so that they'd be evenly spaced and I marked the placement on this bottom ring. Then using a little square, I transferred all of those marks onto the top, just like this, so that I could make sure that my ribs were lined up from top to bottom. You just wanna make sure to mark one of those marks on the top and bottom differently so that you can get them all lined back up in the correct, appropriate location. Then I was trying to think of a way to maybe clamp this whole thing together to hold the ribs in place until I could get some screws in there. And then I decided that's just a waste of time. The best thing to do is just to get some CA glue and accelerator spray and just kind of glue the whole thing up. Now, of course, this isn't going to be strong enough to hold the entire thing together permanently, but it is a perfect solution to get it held together temporarily until I can get screws in. That way things aren't flopping all over the place and falling around and I'm just standing alone in my shop cursing. Nobody likes that. So after gluing all the pieces to one ring, I set the top ring in place. Now I realized I couldn't glue this one on because there was no way to get them all lined up at the same time. So I just glued one section on just to kind of hold the top in place and then I could move each individual rib around and get it perfectly lined up as I needed and sink some screws in, which is exactly what I did next. For this, I'm just using trim head screws so they're not sticking out. I just countersunk them into the plywood about an eighth of an inch and they disappeared, holding my ribs firmly to the top and the bottom. Man, saying things like holding my ribs firmly to my bottom almost sounds like I'm building a person. Anyways, after getting my whole rib structure all together, I wrapped my panel around it one more time just to double check that it was gonna fit like it should. And what do you know? It once again fits absolutely perfect. Next, I needed to glue that panel to my newly created inner structure. There was no great way to get glue on this. I knew it was gonna be messy. 
I knew it was going to be sloppy, and I knew I was going to have a lot of fun smearing glue all over the place. All that I really cared about is that I just put a ton of glue on this thing. I needed it to squeeze out and hit as many surfaces as it possibly could. So I was pretty liberal with the glue, keeping in mind that you're never going to see the inside of this, so if you got a crazy amount of squeeze out, well, it doesn't really matter. So after I did one side, I flipped it over and did the other side, and finally I was ready to wrap this panel around and hook it on. Now, clamping round things can be difficult. In fact, it can be absolutely infuriatingly aggravating. Is that the correct way to say that? But luckily, there is a product made by Rockler called a band clamp that is absolutely perfect for this application. The only thing that's not perfect is the fact that I only have one of them. Why I don't buy things in bulk, I don't know. So I used the one band clamp that I had, which worked awesome. I hooked it around the bottom, and it's got this little ratcheting feature that allows you to snug everything up and get even pressure all the way around. So after getting my strap nice and straight, I tightened it up and ratcheted it down closing that gap and making my seam disappear. Because I only had one of the Rockler brand clamps, I had to use a plain old ratchet strap for the top. This worked, but it wasn't nearly as easy as the Rockler strap because there's a lot more things to contend with. I had to shove some towels in there to keep it from dinging up the piece. So my point in all this is I'm gonna go buy some more of those Rockler brand clamps here in a little bit. While I waited for the glue to dry on my base, I went back over and finished working on my top. Yep, more domino shaped tape to cut out my final shape with that snazzy shaper origin. I mean, look at this thing. It's literally like you're playing Pac-Man. The only difference is instead of eating big yellow balls, you're just cutting out a circle. In no time, I had my 40 inch circle cut out of this one inch white oak, and I was ready to do something stupid. By something stupid, I mean sand. It's not like I did something stupid or made a mistake. I just think sanding's really stupid. But it's one of those things you have to do. After getting my tabletop all sanded, it had been enough time that my glue on my base was nice and dry, so I removed my Rockler clamp and my makeshift ratchet strap clamp and this thing was ready to rock and roll and by rock and roll i meant trying to figure out a way to attach this to the tabletop itself i went back and forth on the best way to do this and finally i settled on threaded inserts with some bolts so i set my base down on a scrap piece of ply and i drilled four holes through the top of it these are just positioning holes that will allow me to transfer those marks onto the bottom of the tabletop itself. So after setting the base on the underside of the tabletop and measuring to make sure that it was perfectly centered, I put on my best pair of stretchy jeans and I climbed up onto the table. Then reaching in and sticking the drill bit through those pre-drilled holes, I just transferred a little mark with the drill bit onto the bottom side of the tabletop, as you can see here. And if you can't see it there, you can see it here. See my four little marks. This is gonna tell me exactly where I need to add my threaded inserts. So using an 11 30 seconds drill bit and a piece of tape to ensure that I don't drill too far and come out the top of my tabletop, I drilled holes big enough to add my threaded inserts. Now whenever I add threaded inserts, I like to squeeze just a little drop of super glue on them before I twist them into place with the hex key. You also want to remember that you want to get these in nice and tight and flush with your tabletop, but you don't want to over twist and actually break the insert or else it's not going to work and then it's going to be glued in the hole and you're going to be in a world of hurt. So get them tight, but not too tight and just let the super glue hold them in place. After getting all my threaded inserts in, I added my bolts just to make sure the threads were still working the way they should. And what do you know, they were all working fantastic. 
Now you might be asking yourself, well, what about wood movement? Are you really just gonna bolt that thing nice and tight to the underside of your solid wood tabletop and hope that wood movement doesn't cause some serious problems? Well, I've got a plan for that. I took a half inch drill bit and I drilled out all the holes for my bolts. The reason I did a half inch is because my bolts are only a quarter of an inch, which means I've got a lot of wiggle room in each one of those holes to allow for wood movement seasonally. Then I sanded down the top just to get rid of all the little bits and bobs of glue and clean up those freshly drilled half inch holes. Then before actually hooking the base onto the tabletop, I decided to pre-finish the bottom. I just figured this would be way easier than trying to finish it after that big giant base was in the way. And I know you're gonna hate me, but this is a white oak table, so of course I'm using Rubio Monocoat's cotton white. But to be fair, it wasn't my decision this time. This piece is actually for a client, and that is what they requested, so get off my back. After getting the underside of my tabletop all finished with that Rubio Monocoat, I set my base on there, lined up my holes with those threaded inserts, and reached down inside and added my bolts to tighten that base nice and securely to the top itself. And with that, there was really only one thing left to do. The base is all put together and attached to the top. The base was pre-finished ahead of time. The bottom of the tabletop has now been pre-finished. So with everything attached and pre-finished, all we've got to do is smear some finish on the top and this thing will be done. Now because I used Rubio Monocoat on every other part of the table, I used Ebony Stain on the top. No, I'm just kidding. I used the same Rubio Monocoat Cotton White because I don't want this table to look stupid. But come on, you've got to admit, the cotton white looks pretty stinking clean on the white oak. And just like that, our modern-ish dining nook table thingamabob is complete and ready to be sent off to its forever home in Nashville, Tennessee for the band for King and Country, whoever they are. Well, there you go. A modern-ish white oak dining nook table. It looks complicated, it looks fancy, but as you saw in the video, it really wasn't that bad. A pretty simple project overall. Now I know what you're gonna ask. Does it tip when you lean on it? Well, no. No, the answer is it doesn't because I specifically made the base big enough to handle the top. You wouldn't want to go much skinnier than this, you might get some top heavy issues. But overall, it's a pretty cool design. I hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure you subscribe down below. Go follow me on Instagram and Facebook, Patreon if you want to support the channel in that way, and check out all the links in the video description.